Okay, last but not least, uh, DAR217. Uh, we were the furthest ahead, and now you're pretty much the furthest behind at this point because I'm finally getting to this video now. I'm going to go through this as quickly as possible, get us cut out, tell you what the final project's going to be. It's going to take probably about three parts here of this lecture to get everything caught up. I'm going to go as fast as possible. First thing, I'm going to do a quick review of the intro, DAR115 intro to editing tools in your toolbox that you should already no, but some of you I did not have for that class, so I'm just going to go review it really fast. The basic tools of post-production, right? This is post-production class. Start. We start in the editing class. The ones I want you to remember and use whenever possible. Parallel action, of course. This is kind of in order with the history of cinema, right? Parallel action was invented in when? That's right. Blue's Clues, 1903. Okay. Parallel action. We have Kuleshov. Now, Kuleshov, we know we don't have to rely on professional actors. We can use models or non-actors as models and build the performance out of the editing. Now in a post-production class, the other thing to remember is that means you can also use things like outtakes. Things that they don't know that the camera's rolling and they're more natural, rea more natural reactions or takes from a completely different scene that work because they're actually reacting differently than they would have. So you always want to remember that with Kuleshov, we build the performance in the editing room in post-production. We have so much more control than people realize in terms of the actual performance, all right? So Kuleshov, remember your Kuleshov, outtakes, uh, takes from different scenes, whatever. Okay, your Eisenstein, right? Rhythmic metric, basic. We went through that in the other classes. I have the other video out there. Rots the other video if you haven't yet to remind yourself. Rhythmic metric. What I haven't covered yet, which I'm going to be putting out a video in another day or two, the tonal overtonal. Tonal and overtonal, essentially the same thing. The mood that you want your audience to feel, you're going to have the edits represent that or help convey that. Okay. The big one, intellectual montage, right? You guys should remember all this, but the cutting to something as a metaphor to help drive home some sort of intellectual point, right? Um, with Eisenstein, we, he had a general that was overly proud. He cut to a shot of a peacock, right? Pride, peacock, display, right? So that's on the most basic level, right? Um, watch the uh, Naked Gun uh, famous uh, intellectual montage sex scene to remind yourselves. Great stuff. Okay. Now, and don't forget graphic match cut. Very few directors are using it as much as they should, including myself. I have to remind myself, you guys need use your graphic match cuts. Um, uh, so uh, those are your basic, uh, that's your basic reveals for the tools in your toolbox for editing. Now specifically onto what we covered in post-production class so far. So we did, I just dropped my dry erase. Oh. Okay, so we did cover chroma key. Uh, chroma key is definitely a post-production uh, tool, but you have to do quite a bit of production work to get it to, to work right. Uh, so let's move on to the wrap-up of what we're doing here, and we're going to focus, again, we're going to review and focus on the final project involving Foley, ADR, additional dialogue replacement, or automated dialogue replacement, you know that one, which is also basically known as looping. Different from dubbing, dubbing is when you replace one language with another, right? And don't forget about having your um, music and sound effects tracks, right? Uh, an M&E track. Okay, losing the point. Okay, Foley, ADR, sound effects. We've covered these, and the main thing I want to take you guys to take away is the non-literal thinking that you should uh, naturally go to, which is unfortunately unnatural for us, uh, especially when we're starting out. We tend to think literally, oh, it's a door slamming, it needs to sound like a door slamming. Wrong, right? Iron Man, he slams the door, it's an evil door slamming because Jebediah Stain is evil, remember? So, non-literal, right? The literal tough stuff, literal sound effects tend to sound canned. Um, we've heard them before, they're too typical, they're too on the nose, right? So canned and on the nose. Uh, usually. Not always, right? We're going to start there, um, and I'm going to come back to that. Uh, and also, conversely, we have uh, the irony that often real sound effects do not sound real to our ears. Mostly from the whole history of cinema has um, made it a point to exaggerate certain things, especially uh, obvious cases, gunshots. Real gunshots don't sound realist. They end up using cannons, howitzers, for pistols. <laughs> 
And if you use an actual 45 for a 45, it sounds fake at this point. It sounds like patink. And so we don't already, we're already, uh, as an audience, we've been trained to use exaggeration or the word we've used before, metaphorical sound effects, right? You're gonna push it, you're gonna bump it beyond, you're gonna exaggerate the effects. Okay, uh, so I want the takeaway, outside the box thinking, avoid literal thinking, uh, think about what you can do and how to push this in we have a couple guiding uh, points on how to push it in the direction because you could go any way, but we talked about theme, uh, sort of guiding which way you're going to exaggerate those sound effects and uh, including the you know the dialogue and and uh, don't and don't forget off speed effects right where you can speed up or slow down a sound effect to make it right you can exaggerate it that way. I, 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 Distracted. Anyway, okay, so metaphorical, we often use the theme to help guide us. Now, the it's similar to in the lighting class where we talk about motivation, right? The light, you have this, uh, if it's a horror film, the lighting's going to be different than a comedy. So if you have a horror film, the sound effects and other things should be different than a comedy, right? So have that exaggeration, use theme to help guide you, similar to the way motivation guides us, the one we liked. Okay, we are filtering reality. Uh, unfiltered reality is not worth paying a ticket to go see at the theater, right? So your job as a filmmaker, as an artist, is to filter reality. And the filter is, I'm wrapping this up, we talked about it already, is you. You are the filter. Your personal knowledge, education, uh, uh, your personality, your likes, your dislikes, that should be your guide. Make a movie that you want to see that no one else would make. It becomes your style without it becoming a superficial style. You're going to filter the world through your, your eyes. That's what we want to see. Exaggeration, exaggeration, exaggeration. Unfiltered reality is reality TV, and reality TV, that's right, sucks. Got it. Okay. Uh, most post-production is wasted opportunity. We get to, we finally, you know, we shoot these films and we're just trying to get them done. And it's sad because there's so many things you can do with that post-production. Take the time, put a little extra effort in, get, uh, you know, think in terms of what's the theme of this movie? How can I emphasize the theme with the sound effects, with what I do with the dialogue, with the way I edit the dialogue? dialogue. And not to mention music, which we're about to get to, which is going to be a big part of the final project. Okay. Outside the box thinking, filter the reality through you and your personality. Don't be embarrassed about who you are, the stuff you like. Be proud of it and give us that filter. We need something new. We don't need unfiltered reality. Unfiltered reality is free, right? I'm not paying money to go to a movie theater or nowadays download and stream anything that I can get for free, okay? Filter that reality, exaggerate, push it, push it, push it. Let the theme of the, what you're trying to say, the, the argument you're making in that film, guide you in which way you're pushing it. Otherwise, there's infinite variables, right, as we learned. And be yourself and let that be your style. Okay, now the project. So we're going to talk about music, and your final projects are going to involve music. We'll get into that in more detail. This is going to take uh, two dry erase boards, so I'm going to have to do this in two parts. Okay. Music, we've talked about, we got to talk about a little bit. We talked about soundtrack and we looked at King Kong. And you remember the composer for King Kong? His name was, that's right, Max Steiner. Um, and as you remember, the mnemonic device, uh, Stein means stone in Germany, so he's a Max Stoner, right? Like a lot of you guys. Anyway, so uh, that, co that composed soundtrack, the music, that the score that was written specifically for the movie, that they would watch the movie and conduct the orchestra to, that became part of the tradition. It was even in the silent, so-called silent film days. There were scores specifically created for silent uh, films that a live orchestra would accompany in the bigger uh, markets in New York and Los Angeles at the large theaters. So, uh, but in King Kong, we really saw a lot of innovations that Max Steiner did. Um, and Max Steiner leads directly to uh, the still very popular uh, and common uh, uh, type of composed soundtrack like John Williams, right? Famous John Williams, everyone knows Star Wars, John Williams, and a whole bunch of other movies, pretty much every 
Spielberg and Lucas film. Um, and in there we have, I just, we had talked briefly about uh, Bernard Herrmann, who uh, did a lot of Hitchcocks and then also famously Taxi Driver, which is where we talked about, right? And uh, Memnonic Device for Bernard Herrmann, um, his, his name, H-E-R-R-M-A-N-N, -N. well, Herr is man in German, so his name is Bernard Man-Man. Okay. Anyway, John Williams. It's John Williams. Okay. So John Williams, uh, Star Trek, it's, you see the direct lineage from King Kong, from Max Steiner, to, uh, to Star Wars, right? Uh, King Kong had his own theme. Darth Vader had his own theme, right? Leap motif. We talked about creating this. And this is all part of some of the things we've talked about with filtering our reality and adding and exaggerating. However, you can go too far. Right, and just like with the sound effects, we talked about the very first sound designer essentially um, was Murray Spivak, and he led directly to Ben Burt for also Star Wars, right? So, uh, and if you have the sound effects, if you have the music uh, too obvious, too on the nose, you get what's referred to as Mickey Mousing here, written MM Mickey Mousing. Remember, it's just too on the nose, it's too obvious, it's too expected, it's been too done, it's too cliche. So. What happens, we start to see, uh, especially in the 60s, uh, and, you know, uh, with inspiration for French New Wave films, we start to use, uh, see the use of pre-existing uh, songs put into soundtracks, right? So we get sort of pop song, pre-existing soundtracks, uh, very famous with Easy Rider and... The Graduate. Easy Rider was supposed to have its own soundtrack, but they used, as a temp track, they cut in a bunch of uh, pre-existing rock songs, and it was too, the, the people who were going to do the soundtrack said, this is too perfect, you've got to just use what you already did. Um, and then we had The Graduate, who had, had the producer had decided, it was Simon and Garfunkel they wanted, and they used most of the songs that were in that movie were already done, uh, with the exception of Mrs. Robinson, which was just that little do 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 part. It was the only thing finished in time for the movie soundtrack. So the Easy Ride to the Graduate, the obvious ones that sort of be, uh, 10 uh, or so years before MTV start the MTV type of music soundtrack. Um, and then also famously, we talked about 2001, where he does essentially the same thing. It had a similar story he used, but classical music. Uh, uh, and a little bit of avant-garde stuff, right, the Leggetti stuff. Uh, but he used it was a, had already existed, and he used it as a what well, the idea was a temp track. But he hated the soundtrack that was uh, submitted so bad he just stuck with the temp track, and he convinced uh, the producers to come up with the money to buy the the soundtrack. Now this was different, right? This is the '60s. The part of the problem now is it's pretty cost prohibitive, uh, unless you're Tarantino. <laughs> so Tarantino does this great. He does this very well, but he has a very large budget. So you're going to be looking at working with local musicians or your own music. And this is where we're going to get into the assignment. We're going to get creative and um, work with what we've got and we're going to take, you know, uh, our one of our movies, you're going to take one of your existing films or make a new film and you're going to create a soundtrack that is using music but because of our restrictions, uh, money and locations, you're going to use musical or some type of, we're going to use music, right? And the, the assignment, it, as it appeared on the syllabus and what we're doing now, is basically music as sound effects and sound effects as music. And I'm going to, when I switch to the board, I'm going to write these two the films. But you need to see Dunkirk and There Will Be Blood. Okay, Dunkirk and There Will Be Blood. Why these two movies? Because... Uh, of all the things we talked about, they have their soundtrack is uh, on the, the, when we talk about filtration or pushing or exaggeration or metaphor. These two films, uh, relatively recent, Dunkirk more so, uh, really, really great, great examples, two of the best examples I can think of, of really pushing what a soundtrack can do. Pushing the theme of the film, pushing the metaphor of the film. Uh, if it wasn't for the soundtrack, most of There Will Be Blood would be some guy walking in the desert. But because of the soundtrack, the tenseness, the, the, the sort of driving uh, underlying pulse, uh, sort of driving towards this catastrophic destiny, 
is part of this theme, right? And you feel it, you, you uh, subconsciously feel it the entire movie, and it's done in a very clever, uh, the absolute opposite of on-the-nose way. And, and, they, and, and you see the same thing with Dunkirk. We have uh, this sort of uh, machine uh, music sound effect on the ships, uh, all of this sort of time-ticking kind of... Uh, uh, music, it's really, really um, clever and uh, pushing all the things that I think uh, most films don't do. Uh, having a theme-driven filter on our reality, using it as metaphor, the music is metaphor as well, and taking chances. Okay, now, uh, to wrap up the little lecture on, on your soundtrack choices, avoid trends. Uh, this is a uh, drawing of a producer chasing money. Okay, I'll explain. Uh, so you might, right now, and for the last 30 years, somehow it's still considered new, hip-hop is a thing, and we have Hamilton. Okay, it seems to work. I haven't seen it, but it seems to be a big success. People, are, I can imagine lots and lots of movies where a hip-hop soundtrack would be absolutely correct, but just because hip-hop is popular, or hip or pop, <laughs> it doesn't mean that's what you should go with. Uh, is it appropriate? Is it pushing the theme of your film? Is it going to um, uh, have that extra filtration, bump it, that metaphor to push home what you're trying to say with your mind? It might, it might very well be, right? Obviously, if you're making a movie called Straight Outta Compton. Uh, okay, so uh, now a better example in terms of how terrible it can be. I can't think of a hip hop movie I've seen that the soundtrack destroyed it. I can think of te several TV commercials and TV shows. Um, Janet's Planet, the, this very, very, yeah, non-hip-hoppy woman trying to do hip-hop stuff. Anyway, let's get back to the 80s. Synth rock was a thing. Synthesizer rock. Now, it had worked pretty well in a few movies that made quite a bit of money. The big example would be Top Gun. Top Gun, however, was set in the actual 80s while it was filmed. It was a contemporary film, and so it was using contemporary trends, synth rock, right? I went to the Danger Zone, Kenny Loggins and all those guys, and it worked. It worked, and then it made a lot of money, and so what happened? The next, in the next year or two, we saw a lot of synth, synth rock uh, soundtracks being slapped onto movies that had no business. No business. I didn't write up here, but Hoosiers is an otherwise really good movie, almost destroyed by its synth rock soundtrack. It's just terrible if you actually start to notice it. And hopefully, first time you watch it, you're caught up in the story, you don't notice how terrible the soundtrack is. But even worse than that, a movie that does not actually escape. The soundtrack is so bad, it destroys the movie completely. Lady Hawk. Watch Lady Hawk, and after this, you'll know now know why it's not good. You think, I don't know what's wrong with this movie. It's, 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 it's beautifully shot. Vittorio frickin' Storaro shot it. Good screenplay, good performances, decent special effects, and you're just watching, you're like, I don't know what's wrong with it. It's the soundtrack. It's the most inappropriate soundtrack. It's set in the frickin' Middle Ages, and it's got synth rock. It's so unbelievably bad. I, if anyone sees this, my plea, please, someone redo the soundtrack. Whoever has the rights, redo the soundtrack appropriately with, you know, maybe period correct musical instruments. I don't know. A Gregorian chant would be better than what it has. And re-release it. I would love to see that. Uh, I would pay money to see it. Please do. Okay. So, now, specifically your projects, we're going, and I'll, I'll do one more board here, but basically, music as sound effects, sound effects as music, which we see in Dunkirk and There Will Be Blood, and I'll explain.